Good afternoon and welcome to the First Unitarian Universal Society of Albany. And welcome to Bill Batts Memorial Service. I begin with these words by the Reverend Richard Gilbert. We pause in the silent mystery of life and death, time and space. In the holy peace of this hour, let us now reflect on the life of Bill Batt, a man of more than four score and two years. The full cycle of his life has now completed, and for this we are grateful. Rest assured that this will be a time of celebration and thanksgiving, more than a time of sadness and loss. Though the pain of losing one we loved is present this hour, we are also deeply grateful for our time together. In time, our feelings of appreciation will overshadow the sadness, and even now, we rejoice in his memory. May the sense of relief come over us that all his suffering has come to an end. May a sense of joy come over us as we remember him in the fullness of his vigor. May a sense of hope come over us that his life has given us so much for which to live and to love. And I light our chalice with our traditional chalice lighting, which you will see on the screen, or you have it in your order of service. All three seekers of truth gather to excite the human spirit, to inspire its growth and development, to respond morally and ethically to a troubled world, and to sustain a vital and nurturing religious community. I have a couple of readings for you. The first, a poem by Emily Dickinson. Death is a dialogue between the spirit and the dust. Dissolve, says death. The spirit says, sir, I have another trust. Death doubts it, argues from the ground. The spirit turns away, just laying off for evidence an overcoat of clay. And this poem from Louise Gluck, The Wild Iris. At the end of my suffering, there was a door. Hear me out, that which you call death, I remember. Overhead noises, branches of the pine shifting, then nothing. The weak sun flickering over the dry surface. It is terrible to survive as consciousness buried in the dark earth. Then it was over, that which you fear, being a soul and unable to speak, ending abruptly, the stiff earth bending a little, and what I took to be birds darting in low shrubs. You who do not remember passage from another world, I tell you, I would speak again. Whatever returns from oblivion returns to a voice, to find a voice. From the center of my life came a great fountain, deep blue shadows of azure 
seawater. The choice of poetry to remember Bill may seem a little odd for somebody who is such a policy wonk. I'm listening to a funeral of one of but my colleagues. Bill did have poetry in his extensive library. So I have a sense that it was one of the paths to his heart. He was not a believer in anything supernatural, but had an appreciation of words and their power to convey ideas. If there was anything that beckoned him beyond his mind and sense experience, it likely would be found through language. Matters of life and death concerned Bill beyond the tax policy that was his consuming passion for the last 20 years. In 1983, he gave his first public talk on the right to die with dignity. Bill served on the national board and as a spokesman for the Hemlock Society that advocated for the right to be allowed to die rather than be kept alive by heroic measures. A phone number, 1-800-HEMLOCK, rang in Bill's home for several years to respond not just to families in difficult straits, but to students doing papers, media representatives, and others. Remember, this was before the hospice movement became the compassionate option to stop medical um, life support interventions. The Hemlock Society wanted the termini terminally ill person to have the choice to end their lives once their illness had progressed to a phase with no hope for recovery. The advocacy work today called medical aid in dying evolved out of Bill's and others energetic efforts in the 1980s. Bill was always an idea guy, a thinker, an idealist, a person who was interested in the ways institutions and government can make a morally affirming positive difference in the world. I wonder if he got some of that sense of civic responsibility by taking being a Boy Scout seriously. Attaining the rank of Eagle Scout, he served as a camp counselor in a Boy Scout camp in the Berkshires. And I suspect his moral character development came from being raised in a Unitarian church in Springfield, Massachusetts. Bill was also the firstborn of three children. His parents were both teachers in Springfield. And I don't have much that I can report about his youthful years, except his graduation from the University of Massachusetts, majoring in the science of government. Where we start to see his life taking a distinctive shape was being one of the first hundred people to volunteer for the Peace Corps in 1962, continuing until 1965. He served in Northern Thailand, an experience that left a lasting imprint on his life. You'll hear more about that in a video presentation a little later by Epison Intralawan. After returning to the United States, he completed a master's degree in political science from the Northern Illinois University, focused mainly on developing uh, rather development in developing nations. He also studied for two summers at Penn State University and the University of Michigan with the support of National Science Foundation grants. His PhD work at the School of Public Affairs brought him to the 
University of Albany, where he completed his thesis in moral reasoning and social structure. In 1971, he returned to Thailand for a year to do his research on that topic. He was able to show that there was a strong correlation between the patrimonial social structure of Thailand outlined by Max Weber and the moral reasoning of Cor Lawrence Kohlberg. At the time, this was controversial with his thesis advisor, but he believed he was later vindicated by Jurgen Haber Habermas, one of the great uh, social philosophers, making the same argument that he did in his thesis. Bill married, his married life began in 1968 with his first marriage to Roberta, a psychiatrist. They settled in Ithaca, where she got the primary source of income serving as the director of a mental health clinic. This meant Bill would find adjunct work positions in the area and then continued working on his PhD. They built a deck house in the village of Cahuga Heights, and he joined the uh, Unitarian Universalist congregation there, too. Bill served as president of that congregation in Ithaca. He was just in his 30s, which I think is remarkable. And Bill served uh, as the leader of the town of Ithaca Democratic Party. He ran as a sacrificial candidate for town supervisor twice in 75 and 77. Bill's life, unfortunately, in Ithaca ended with divorce in 1981. Roberta chose to follow her desire for a lesbian relationship, and this was deeply traumatic for Bill, and he decided to move here and starting to rebuild a new life. Bill was able to get a job in state government, working in backroom policy analysis. His connections in our congregation were critical to that new start. Mary Van Eyck, I don't know if anybody here would remember her, maybe some of you do, was an elderly blind member of our congregation and was happy to take Bill in as a boarder as he consolidated his new life. He stayed with her for two years, almost kind of serving as his surrogate son for him, or for her rather. Uh, he organized her 80th birthday party here that I discovered looking at the Susquicentennial history book. Useful resource. Bill moved to his North Albany bungalow in 1984, where he remained for many years. Socially, Bill established himself by leading a chapter of former Peace Corps volunteers for the Capital District, got involved here at Albany UU, and worked with several environmental advocacy organizations. Bill married again after meeting Kate Skelton at a policy conference in 1990. She was a UU and a vigorous social activist and fellow academic with a similar circle of friends. A match looked great on paper, but after two years, unfortunately, that one failed as well. The enduring relationship that finally worked out for Bill was his match with, Carol, uh, with Karen Donaldson. She retired after a 30-year medical practice in Palm Springs, California, to move in with Bill here in Albany. Retirement afforded Karen the opportunity to spend time doing a lot of reading, surfing the web, and watching TV, especially watching C-SPAN with Bill. I can just see the two of them watching C-SPAN together. Amazing. And she loved to dote on her two cats. They were able to stay together until she died, unfortunately, in 2021. Bill had finally found an enduring connection with someone he could care for as she had some very serious medical conditions. I wonder if that caregiving gave him a deeper access to his compassionate side 
as they aged and enjoyed a loving relationship together. You'll hear more about Bill's interest in and passion for Georgian economics from others. So I'd like to conclude my part of this presentation with some concluding words from the 1400 word obituary that Bill composed for himself in 2015. Just imagine publishing that many words in the Times Union. Didn't do that. So Bill writes, Bill regarded his life as fulfilled, even though he was not done with living. He was most proud of his work on causes of a public nature, from his first and later visits to Thailand, to his advocacy for death with dignity through the Hemlock Society, and most of all, through the furtherance of the ideas of Henry George. He was gratified to see many of the Georgist ideas were being accepted and even adopted by the time of his death. He fully expected, along with George, that someday his ideas will prevail. And I wish that for Bill as well. I'm going to conclude here. and We have three presentations. Uh, we have two that are video presentations that you'll see here on the screen and here. And then uh, Josh will come up and speak up in the front. Dear Bill, sorry that I couldn't be there in person, but I hope you will be okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. I feel very honored to give a final remark for your memory service. Our relationship began well before I was born. Remember, 60 years ago, in 1962, you came to Payao. If I remember you correctly, your Peace Corps number is 460. The story that you often tell me is that your given Thai name is Pipat, which means a great development, but you didn't like it. You said it sounds like Peapot. Anyway, we felt very grateful. You came from a very far away to Payao. At that time, Payao is a village. There is no paved road. There is no public utility. And you came to teach English to this poor student. After your Peace Corps volunteer ended in 1965, you came back to the United States. We lost touch a little bit, but the relationship remained. My parents come to visit you again in 1989. At the time, you worked for the New York State Assembly. You came to Thailand again in 19. 91. This is, I believe, it's your fifth time visiting Thailand. I wasn't know you that much at the time. But in 1996, I had a great opportunity to study abroad. And my parents said that, go live with Bill. So I came 1996 and staying with you for five years at the 680 North Pearl Street. My five years staying with you has changed my life completely from engineering to economic major. Thank you so much for giving me a birth for my intellectual life. Without your guidance, 
I would be lost and my life would be boring and meaningless. You remember these people? You are so kind to them. You helped prove reading their dissertation. At the end of my first trip to United States, we went to California together with Karen. And then I came back to Thailand to teach at the local university. And then I have another opportunity to further my study. This time, I have no hesitation to go back to USA. But unfortunately, I have another study at Vermont, which is not far from Albany, New York. So remember, you helped me buy a, a, an apartment. Also, move and drive my car to Burlington, Vermont. In 2017, you came as your seventh trip to Thailand. This was your last trip to Thailand but it was the most uh, productive visit. Why? You gave a, a presentation to university and also government officer regarding George's economics. Your presentation stimulated lots of thinking and discussion. And later on, Thailand adopted land value taxation to some, to some extent. I hope you are pleased to hear that. Also at the trip, you visited our old friends, a Thai student. Now they are professor and senior government advisor. You also visited our family because we had a memorial service for my dad. This year in March, 2022, you also helped give a lecture to my student. So let me share some of your lecture. Good afternoon, class. Uh, Today is a uh, very honor that we have uh, Professor Bill Bat, you know, who is uh, my surrogate father, as well as um, a former professor who later on worked for the New York State Assembly. He is a tax um, expert, and today um, he extends help to explain the classical economics you know, because he is really into it. So everyone, please welcome him to our class. Uh, Bill, the floor is yours. Well, okay, I'm happy to be here because uh, I'm very interested in Thailand still. I was there first as Peace Corps volunteer in 1962, and I go back frequently. And when this pandemic ends, I hope I can visit again. Please come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here's John Stuart Mill again. He talks about, again, how the notion of ownership of property means that those that have title get a free good it's called the unearned increment landlords grow richer in their sleep anyway that's the beginning of john stuart mill's thinking but he didn't fully understand that society ought to collect the rent it was only with Henry George 
after he had read all the work of the previous economists that he said not only is the their rent from nature and the landlords or the people who own title are collecting the rent but society should collect it and we should not tax people's labor and we should not tax things that people make like cars or computers or refrigerators or houses we should society should collect that rent and that rent should be used to pay for all the goods and services that governments should provide that was henry george's gift to the discourse that society owned the rent and it should collect it Mm-hmm. He says, as no man made the land, so no man can claim a right of ownership in the land. And then he says, there are three ways to, to get wealthy. Work, gift, and theft. <laughs> and he says that essentially most people, if you go back in history, got title to their land by either force or fraud one way or the other because when you go back to nature before history no, all land it. was owned by people and you have a few final words to my students not really well we'll we'll talk informally later but right now um i think it's important that um that the students understand economics as part of political philosophy as part of nature and you cannot separate out just economics and make it divorced from the rest of knowledge it ought to be integrated completely Wow, that is a very final, important word. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, great. We'll uh, talk later. Also, talk a lot about Henry George idea, which I heard many times. Here is your presentation, remember? I did not, I did not think that that would be our last meeting. But Bill, I want to reassure you that even without your presence, I will continue following Henry George's philosophy of economic justice, which has such powerful impact on your life. Again, thank you so much my surrogate American father for the time we spent together. I know we will meet again someday. Love you so much. Bye-bye for now. Hello, everyone. I am here on behalf of Robert Schockenbach Foundation, a Georgist organization that Bill Batt was on the board of for many years, to thank him for his commitment and devotion and to say farewell. I am Lee Hatchadorian, president of RSF. Bill served on the board of RSF from 2002 to 2011 and rejoined in 2015 and had been on the board for the past seven years during the second stint. Any of you who've served on nonprofit organization boards probably know that the first problem is getting people to show up to meetings. Not so with Bill. Until very recently, he could be counted on to be there for all of our in-person events, conference calls, and later video meetings. He was also a regular presence and organizer at the annual Council of Georgist Organizations meeting. I first met Bill at his Georgist event in New York City. 
I found him, as many of you will have, to be affable, talkative, and welcoming, and above all, optimistic. He devoted himself to a number of causes over his life, and it can be hard to stay the course, but his relentless optimism was infectious. When you were around him, you always believed that a better world was possible. Bill also had a long interest in geographic information systems uh, and was interested in land value maps as a way to show spatial inequality in a way that was immediately visually understandable. Uh, as a professor of GIS myself, I was happy to have someone else on the board who understood the power of maps. And in the past few years, RSF has published several web maps of property records and spatial inequality in major cities, and we owe Bill a debt for inspiring this program direction. On behalf of RSF, including myself, our executive director, Josie Foss, and our board and staff, we are grateful, Bill, for your passion and for the time you devoted to RSF. Farewell. We will miss you. And Josh, if you'd like to speak, please. I'm good. It's funny. Uh, Bill was, I would say, one of my mentors. I have had two in my life. One was a very difficult, irascible, uh, economist and professor of economic history. And uh, he was, as he proudly said, I was on the spectrum. And he alienated almost everybody that he ever met. That was Steve Cord, who passed recently. Uh, and the second mentor was Bill Batt. And Bill was very different. And in a way, his influence was, was much more lasting. And I'm going to riff off of what everybody has said thus far, he was a tax expert. He was an expert in policy, but unlike all the experts out there, there was blood and heart and soul behind what he did and what he espoused. And he inculcated into me the sense of, okay, this is a good idea, Josh, great analysis. How does it help people? How does it help the world? And if you can't understand that, then you shouldn't be here. And I, I agree. Surprisingly enough, it's not enough to be an expert. It's not enough to have all the facts. You have to have a spirit and a soul and a conviction that what you're doing is going to make people's lives better. It's going to make the environment safer. It's going to make our politics less corrupt. It's going to hopefully bring in a new day that the American promise and the promise of the world can finally be realized. Bill was uh, always teaching and he never stopped. Uh, when we would drive often hundreds of miles to conferences, uh, he would be my, my co-pilot, so to speak. And so I would get, instead of books on tape, I would have these seminars on political economy. And it really helped a lot. And then when we pulled into the uh, driveway of whatever city council we were speaking to, or uh, whatever nonprofit group that we were proselytizing, I guess you could say, uh, he said, are you ready? And I said, yeah, yes, sir, I'm ready, let's go. And he was so affable and Enthusiastic is, is the word that keeps coming up, coming to mind. What we support and what he supported and what you all support, justice throughout the world, uh, it seems like a very tough thing to get, but that's what he stood for and pushed for and insisted that myself and many of the other younger Georges uh, that are coming up 
he spent his time with the young Georges more than I think uh, a lot of a lot of the other older ones did. And he encouraged people to not be afraid to go out into the world. And uh, I think testify is maybe uh, too strong a word, but he certainly bore witness to the possibilities of an idea that could improve the world. And I carried that, I've carried that with me and I still hold it today. Uh, Bill got into Henry George uh, around the time that I was interested in, in Henry George, and that's in the early 90s. He met uh, my, my future stepfather, it turns out, and uh, an economist from SUNY, Albany, uh, Don Reeb, uh, and they got together a project to help the poor town of Amsterdam, New York, use the Henry George program. And it was a tough battle. And as Bill knew, most battles are gonna be lost. That's the way it is when you're a person of peace and a person of ideas. Uh, there, there are swordsmen and, and vandals all over the world, but very few people of peace. And so Bill persuaded uh, the, the out of work steel mill workers and the out of work factory workers and these uh, city officials in Amsterdam that Amsterdam was not a lost cause, birthplace of Kirk Douglas. Uh, he was very happy to always, always note. And he got them to adopt this program and it failed in the long run because the forces that want to get rich without doing any work, as John Stuart Mill said in that quote, people that want to get rich without doing any work often win the battle, but not the war. And uh, they worked hard, these three people, to get Amsterdam and its citizens to understand that they were being cheated in a way that's hard to identify, but that there was a way out. And Amsterdam, has anybody been to Amsterdam? They're neighbors of us here. There you go, good. And towns like that, Gloversville, uh, Mechanicsville, Oneonta, we all did work there together. And some of that is, uh, we think, bearing fruit. And uh, Bill could speak to anybody and never spoke down to anybody, never patronized. And he always had a smile to encourage people to join him on this, this, this journey of not only promoting justice, but trying to get it implemented. And his work on maps, as uh, Lee Hatchadorian said, uh, really inspired me to use maps and data to make a point about justice. And we still do that to this day. Uh, we switched sort of our, our aim to uh, graphically illustrating how the world looks through an economic lens and, and a Georgia's lens and uh, using technology and science. He wasn't afraid of that at all. He tried to teach himself how to make these fancy maps, uh, the GIS maps that, that we've been talking about. And he did a pretty good job. And I should just say that in, I'm going to finish, and I'm talking almost technocratic stuff, uh, but he was not an autocrat. But his map of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, another forgotten city in the, in the middle of uh, the state of Pennsylvania, the capital, formerly a very depressed city, uh, he produced a land value map of the city, which is still to this day hanging in city hall. And it's 10 feet tall and six feet wide, this map. And uh, Harrisburg has kept, kept the uh, faith, if you will, because Bill had a deep abiding, abiding faith in science and people. And that's such a, a great memory. And it's something that we'll, we all can carry with us for the rest of our lives. And I know I will. Thank you very much. Just take all that in for a few minutes as we enjoy a little musical reflection. And you have a story that you'd like to share. 
briefly. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna take the microphone around to, for people to speak. And we'll also, the people who are watching on Zoom, if you have uh, a similar memory that you'd like to share, you could find your Zoom hand to raise it under the reactions button and uh, our multimedia technician can help you identify yourself and speak when that opportunity comes. That's better. Thank you. So I know, Nancy, you had something you wanted to say. So why don't you like it? Hi, I'm Nancy Willie Schiff. Um, I, we all owe a debt of gratitude for Bill's work on medical aid and dying. And that work continues. And in his honor and his memory, I hope you'll join the campaign that is in the legislature now starting in january but in addition i have a personal anecdote um in december of 1984 bill gave me a phone call and said would you like to come to a new year's eve party that my partner and i are hosting with a date and i said i'd like to come but i don't have a date well two days later he called me back and said there's this fellow who's coming without a date would it be okay if i gave him your phone number and I said, sure, what do I have to lose? Well, I was married to that fellow less than two years later. So in addition to all the skills that Bill had, I'd like to add the skill of matchmaking. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. I you didn't know that. Other people who've got stories they'd like to share. Yeah. Um, Hi, my name's Rob Smith. Um, when I first came to this congregation, I don't know, 25, four, more than a quarter of a century ago, um, one of the first things that they asked me to do was to lead a service. So I did. Back then, did everything. Uh, <laughs> and I chose a song. One of the songs I chose was uh, Gandhi's favorite song, Rajaputi Rajava. We started singing it, and Bill stood up and he said, I hadn't met him before. He stood up and he said, I can't sing this. And I stopped. <laughs> I said, okay, uh, why can't you sing it? And he said, because I don't understand the words. It was all in, uh, I don't know, Urdu, I guess, Hindi. Not sure what language it's in. Um, but uh, it, uh, it's just a song about how it doesn't matter what you call God. We're all, we're all uh, dealing with the same thing. Um, and uh, I, so I asked the congregation. Well, uh, anybody here can can translate it, and lo and behold, there was a guy here who could translate it. He did. Um, we tried uh, somewhat raggedly to sing it in translation with the uh, with the guy who was translating it. Didn't work too well, but the uh, the it added to the understanding of what we were talking about immeasurably, and I think it spoke to Bill's dedication to understanding things to the truth and to uh, not just let things pass by unremarked. And I, I always later on, as I got to know Bell better uh, and learned about Georgism and all the rest of it, I really appreciated that about Bill, that he was a man who really strove not only to understand things, but to help others understand them. And um, I'm sorry he's gone. Other speakers. Do we have anybody on Zoom? So far, we have no raised hands on Zoom. Um, we did have one submission to the meeting chat. Oh, would Edward, read that? From Edward Dodson um, that says, what Bill contributed in writing to the cause of economic justice deserves a place in the history of the best works on the issues. Mm. An extensive archive of Bill's writings is housed in the online library of the School of Cooperative Individualism. His writings are cross-listed chronologically in the website section labeled the Biographical History of the Georgist Movement. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Other speakers? Yes. Peggy. I'm Peggy Sherman and, and John and I met Bill when we came to this congregation in the mid 80s, but I also knew him because I worked for the state assembly and um, I think that was challenging because Bill was a theorist and an idealist and that didn't mesh that well with the way we do politics and policy in New York State. So um, it was gratifying to see that when he left the assembly, he had so much, um, so many fulfilling experiences and, and professional um, growth. But I did want to mention one thing he did for our family. Um, when our two sons were in school, he called us one day and asked if we would consider um, be, being the host family for a Thai teacher she was already staying with a local family, but it wasn't working out. And we had such busy lives and, you know, two jobs and work. And, but, you know, we thought highly of Bill. So we sat with him and talked about it and we did it. And it was a wonderful experience for our family. It really led to lasting relationships and a lot of um, great memories. So thank you. Anybody else? Uh, my name is Mary Call, and I'm currently living at the Beverwick where Bill was and where I first met him. And uh, uh, I think everybody at Beverwick would agree that he was a uh, very actively contributing member of the community. He always found jobs that needed doing, and then he'd pitch right in and do it. And um, he was uh, uh, a great friend. He was, um, he and my husband had a great deal in common because they were both um, economic historians and therefore they found a great many common grounds to communicate on. And um, he, uh, I think was, whenever he saw a job that needed doing, he just spoke up uh, and said, I'll do it. Or he would find in the basement of Beverwick an old workbench that was not very functional at this point and say, why don't we, I bet there are a lot of people that would like to do some woodwork and could use it and set about correcting that. So I really just want to add my voice as um, a great friend and uh, a, a appreciative friend of all the nice things he did for all of us at Beverwick. Thank you. Thank you. We have one raised hand. Oh, great. Do you want to put them on the screen for us? Uh, David Triggs, if you could unmute. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I'd just like to take the opportunity to pay a tribute to Bill. Uh, I'm speaking to you from the uh, UK, from London. Um, I'm and so in... sorry to interrupt you. We're just having a slight issue with our sound that hopefully should be fixed momentarily. All right, if you'd like to go ahead and try again, let's see if we can capture your audio now. Thank you very much. Uh, well, my, my name is David Triggs. So I'm 15. Yep, I'm, it's unmuted. Uh, oh. You can hear me? It's unmuted Good. and there's no audio. You're on line two, two, yeah. Are you hearing me now? This is, of course, the one thing we don't test and it doesn't work. <laughs> okay, well, well, I'll say my piece anyway. And uh, if you manage oh. to hear, that's, that's all to the good. If you don't, never mind. Um, I'm speaking to you from London. Uh, so if it's David good Triggs, eyes, you um, can read the uh, captions. <laughs> you can hear my Zoom. 
you can you can, sorry uh, so other other zoom people can hear me by the sounds no, of it we're just having trouble hearing him in the room <laughs> you need a computer on anyway okay well um uh, i'll say again it's david triggs i'm honorary president of the henry george foundation of great britain and i've had occasion to uh, both uh, welcome george um, uh, bill in maybe London i can do from, that from time to time um, and also had the opportunity of enjoying his company in uh, in america in various uh, occasions and really all i'd like to add is just the respect and love that we had for bill here um, always yes both intellectually and friend wise um uh, sorry so yeah, okay so somebody speaking over me okay never mind um anyway it, it, it's really just a tribute to 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 bill um saying how much one appreciated knowing him one was richer on account of that uh, well, maybe both, david you could write something in the chat and then we'll be able to Okay. Catch it there. Okay. All right. Well, I, I'm done. All right. Then. Well, I think we're going to have to stop here. My no. apologies. For, okay. Unfortunately, we couldn't get him on, but maybe we can get the written version of his remarks um, to contribute. Time is slipping by as well. All right. We've heard some beautiful sharings and it's thank you so much for all of the contributions to our service this afternoon. And let us uh, take time to turn inwards a little bit to just connect with his spirit, with poetry again. This is from Walt Whitman. I too pass from the night. I stay a while away, O oh night, but I return to you again and love you. Why should I be afraid to trust myself to you? I love the rich running day, but I do not desert her in whom I lay so long. I know not how I came of you, and I know not where I go with you, but I know I came well and shall go well. I will stop only a time with the night and rise betimes. I will duly pass the day. Oh, my mother, and duly return to you. Let us hold all of our thoughts and reflections from this service as we've recultivated the memory of Bill together. And let us enjoy a little talk from the Goldberg variation to have some reflective time before our service ends. And let us extinguish our chalice with the words that you'll find in the order of service. We did have a chat submission from excellent let's let's do the chat submission it reads a short tribute to bill from london england a good and generous friend much respected for both his intellect and heart thank you bill you will be much missed okay great of course what happens here but device here freezes up <laughs> well i'm gonna close with a blessing of the gratitude that we have to have someone like bill in our congregation but bill is not so unusual 
we have so many gems of wonderful people who gather in our congregation and the community that we create together is so special and it's really valuable that we can celebrate those lives when they come and their time in this world is done we come into this world and we leave it it is beautiful to be able to leave a print behind in the lives of the people that we loved we end our service but not the memory of bill in that he remains in our hearts we have a wonderful reception over in Channing Hall through the doors out here, and we encourage your participation in that to visit with each other, share memories of Bill together, and express our gratitude for his life. Thanks for coming today.